do share a bit about your background or yes your... well planes pain corruption and generational trauma who else were you going to call <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> You need a, re- a lot of real estate to, I don't know, park your planes or something. Right, right. Personal helicopters, cars, whatnot. Yeah. Uh, park the- your family. <laughs> <laughs> you have to park your family really well. Right. No double parking, though. One relative per direction. <laughs> Antonovna, that's a that's an aircraft made for us. It's uh, optimized for rough landing trips and uh, <laughs> improvised airplanes in the middle of nowhere. Right. Oh. You know, that's why you see them in all the movies about Cochrane's in <laughs> <laughs> Latin America. Our guy also ended up accused of raking up some 250 billion lei in debt by subcontracting auxiliary services to third parties. I thought outsourcing was supposed to be cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Not when he does it. <laughs> Not when Romanians do it. No. <laughs> That's not how you run a business. <laughs> if you don't, on you either run money. it into the ground is yeah. the only running we do around here. That's why you have the Antonovs. <laughs> you can run it into the ground. <laughs> Rough landing strips. <laughs> yeah. This is a very small country. We don't necessarily need domestic air travel to be the most convenient option. Hey, we need don't, don't miss the size. It's what you do with it. <laughs> right. I'm told. I don't know. Right, we're not doing anything with it. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. It's small enough to handle, but we're not doing anything just, with it. It's just sitting there limply. <laughs> <laughs> Eyes, O Lord of Podcasting Darkness, for I have bought thee a new, fresh guest. Hello there. I wouldn't really say fresh, but okay. (laughs) I mean, reasonably fresh. I've been here for a while. (laughs) Within the expiration date. Within the expiration date. How are you doing? It's an interesting Saturday. It's, oh, interesting. By interesting, do you mean rainy? Well, we're doing this, which is interesting so far. Okay, well, that's <laughs> that, that's encouraging, I guess. Interesting is one of my favorite words. It covers so much. Yeah, I'm talking about the shitty weather, which I know you love. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> that got, is a nuance exclusive to you. <laughs> we've got this sort of dynamic. The weather I like, you, you detest and vice versa. You know what else I like about this weather? This autumn is quite punctual. Yes. And I appreciate that. (laughs) Extremely. Annoyingly so. (laughs) Yeah. So if if the weather is getting, you know, cold and uh, gloomy, uh, I'm guessing you're planning on uh, initiating your bake-off. Well, it's uh, sweet potato pies all through October. So. Oh, okay. Okay, (laughs) And then October is pumpkin time. You've got your scheduled uh, lock then. Yes, of course. You know, I'm on a pie diet until February. <laughs> and then February, you switch to pizza? Salads. Salads? Oh, okay. <laughs> Straight to the salads. Well, a pizza is already sprinkled throughout the year anyway. So, you know, there's summer pizzas, there's winter pizzas. I mean, pizza is a vegetable, basically. Pizza is a year-round staple. Yeah. Do you want us to slowly but surely get into the topic of uh, this episode? I mean, it's your podcast. <laughs> I have, yeah, I know. I <laughs> We're, we're, we're not that good at small talk. Well, I'm not that good at small I, talk. I, I, I always try to force a bit of banter into it because, as I said, the, the, apparently this is what the successful podcasters are doing. So, you know, you have to learn from the best. But then, you know, how are you going to exceed their level if you keep doing what's already being done? No, but I do it in a cringy fashion. So ah, it's yes. different. <laughs> <laughs> how could I possibly forget? Okay. You know, describe yourself in three words. I just need one, Your Honor. Cringe. <laughs> Today, uh, let's get into the fuselage of the matter. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, spoilers already. You're a bad girl. <laughs> <laughs> you knew what you were getting when yeah. you called me over. Exactly. <laughs> So today we're going to discuss the state of the Romanian national airlines, or more precisely, we'll be looking at various snapshots from its recent uh, history. And uh, all our five listeners might uh, (laughs) might ask themselves, why choose this as our topic? And in a more roundabout way, I would say that, at least for me, this this, this topic was prompted by the fact that uh, we've talked with other guests about privatization on this podcast before and why certain things shouldn't be uh, subject to the whims and fancies of the free markets because they are 
essential for the well-being of society, you know, things like education, healthcare, to a certain extent, public transport, and so on. And uh, even if you want to privatize certain niches, it's a good idea to not just, you know, have them taken off the hand of the state and then whatever happens to them, I guess, is fair play, like, Maybe, maybe follow up. It, it, it would be nice, you know. Uh, but today I'd like us to look at how just having something nominally state run and sort of removed from the marketplace doesn't just by magic create a service that is somehow perfectly tuned to serve the people and provide for the public good. And I know this sort of sounds very obvious for people living in the dream that is Romania and probably many other parts of the world, but surprisingly I found many left-leaning people on the internet who have this kind of naive, I would say, idea that if you already has, have something that's nationalized, that, that, that then you're basically on the right track. Just as, you know, other People on the other side of the equation are so, you know, completely opposed to the idea of having anything publicly owned that they uh, deny any benefits for, from the idea. So the point we're trying to discuss here is that details matter. <laughs> and oversight is not one of our virtues. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and tweaks and course correcting matter, even if you are in principle, so to speak, on the right track to provide for the people. And uh, the fact that the sort of people you have in key position is important because as tired as the whole corruption shtick is, corruption is bad. So Continues to be bad. Yes, yes, also yes. Also a year-round staple. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but unlike pizza, not as delicious. No. <laughs> yes. And, and you know, a system that uh, has uh, bad, corrupt people in it, uh, even though on paper it's supposed to work wonderfully, it won't. <laughs> it, it will just, you know, take on the image of the people actually running it. So I guess taking perhaps such extreme examples as the state of the Romanian national airlines might feel unfair and discouraging to some, but I think that looking at some of the worst case scenarios is the best way to try and weed out the things that prevent institutions or agencies from doing their job, basically, you know, providing for, for all of us. So I I ask Joanna <laughs> to join me for this episode because I was curious to learn about the history and current state of the, as we said, Romanian Airways, which uh, shall be hence uh, known as Starom. And I am uh, very much looking forward to your uh, insights because uh, at least someone in your family had the flying bug. So I guess y you know a bit uh, of the... Just the vibes. <laughs> Just vibes. I mean, we're running on vibes anyhow. Uh, what else do we millennials? have any left <laughs> exactly exactly so you know do 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 share a bit about your background or yes your... well planes pain corruption and generational trauma who else were you gonna call <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i am uh, here because i happen to be the offspring of a uh, flight enthusiast <laughs> <laughs> the issue <laughs> <laughs> the issue <laughs> Um, my father was a fighter pilot, which after retirement joined a civilian airline. Mm -hmm. Not Tarom, but <laughs> mm, okay. But we got a, a little taste of the corporate version, liberal version, whatever you want to call it. Oh, corporations <laughs> of, uh, are the same everywhere, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a model. Yeah. I'm curious to see what you've dug up. <laughs> yeah. I'm not an insider. You're, at you're, all. you're here to sigh and giggle and stuff like right. that. <laughs> sigh. <laughs> sigh, I can do. <laughs> Let's just quickly go through the history of the national flag carrier up until 1989, which has proved a very pivotal year for many of us. <laughs> so, Good year, I'd say, all, yeah, all things yeah. considered. <laughs> Worked uh, out relatively all right. I mean, it depends on who you ask. So the year was 1920 when CFRNA, the French Romanian company for air navigation, was founded with two active aerodromes, one in Arad and another one in Bucharest at Baniasa. So this was in the 20s and then 30s. And then as far as I understood, between the two world wars, seems like the airline was mostly just busy switching between a fuck ton of names. <laughs> It went from the CFRNA to SNA to Lares, then following a merger with a competitor named Sarta, it was renamed TARS. I guess, you I know. I mean, you know, sometimes you, before you figure out what you want to do in life, you got to figure out what you call yourself. Yeah, I mean, when people <laughs> ask you, where were you in the 30s, you are like figuring out yourself, I guess. Soul searching. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> 
Um, TARS was jointly o- owned by the Romanian government and the <clears throat> uh, Soviet liberators. <laughs> <laughs> but, ah, traditions. <laughs> yes, yes. But as we saw uh, in the case of the chocolate factory episode, uh, eventually these sort of uh, mixed joint ventures, uh, Romanian-Soviet joint ventures, gradually re- repossessed by the Romanian side, somewhere around the mid-50s. In 1954, the airline finally adopted its current name of Tarom, Transporturi Aeriene Romane. Accurate. Yes. But <laughs> An accurate name. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it says, it does what it says it's, on the tin. Exactly. <laughs> By 1960, Tarom was flying to a dozen cities across Europe. 1966 saw the operation of its first transatlantic flight. On the 14th of May 1974, it launched a regular service to New York City. Fancy. Not anymore, though. No. So it's fine. <laughs> Lufthansa does all right. <laughs> yeah. Or did back in my day. <laughs> mm. Uh, Being part of uh, the regional group of airlines within the Eastern Bloc uh, meant that for much of its history, Tarom has operated Soviet-designed aircrafts with a few exceptions. With 59 aircrafts in operation in the late 70s, Tarom had the largest fleet in the Eastern Bloc after Aeroflot, the Russian Federation's, well, USSR's fleet. And then, slowly but surely, in came the 90s. <laughs> and Romania just shed its pants in every major industry. A complicated time. <laughs> yes. And uh, boy, uh, Tarom's journey has been rocky as fuck. <laughs> Over the last 30 years, Tarom has reduced or stopped servicing several of its national and international routes, uh, lost a significant chunk of its qualified personnel to competitors, and more recently had to be salvaged during 2020, when even the airlines that had been doing well were hard hit. So you told me a bit about your father's uh, experience as a pilot. Uh, how did the aviation land landscape look like in those years, at least from what you can remember, uh, particularly in terms of any overlaps between civil and military aviation and people going from one to the other? Well, the biggest change that I can recall, I was tiny and completely uh, just how preoccupied t- just with how my tiny own thing. was Joanna. <laughs> um, <laughs> below adulthood. Yes. <laughs> that that should tiny. cover it. <laughs> Uh, the biggest change um, I, I've noticed was after uh, Romania joined NATO, mm-hmm. when I don't want to say a lot, but let's just say several <laughs> um, military outposts were uh, shut down, were shuttered. Yeah. Uh, but the personnel was condensed in those that remained. Mm-hmm. So this sort of led to a sort of big squeeze in the army and some people were faced with an early retirement of sorts. Now, I'm not sure about in other divisions, probably was the same thing. I know about the Air Force, which uh, lost a lot of its more experienced people that way to civil aviation. Mm -hmm. Uh, My father was one of those. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, he didn't have a job left or did he just choose to because he didn't like the direction things were going in? I can't really speak to that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure everyone had their personal Porque reasons. No yeah, I'm sure they each had their reasons. They probably mm-hmm. weighed things. You know, I'm, I'm I'm sure it wasn't a decision taken lightly because if you have sky fever and you're used to flying supersonic fighter jets, you know that nothing else is going to come close to that. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, you make the be- best choice you can. <laughs> it's like going from Formula One to, I don't know, driving a Toyota or something. I mean, I'm sure you can drive a Toyota like you, drive, or I don't know, up to a point. <laughs> Probably shorter races, but but um, but yeah. So it, it it was the case for for a lot a lot of uh, military pilots, but they were important additions to civil aviation because they had very I would say superior training in many ways. I mean, these are people who could fly without seeing anything out the window. Mm-hmm. They could just fly by instruments and do it very well. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing also in emergency cases or things like that, they had better... Well, the training is pretty different. It's it's different uh, different avionics, different mm-hmm. reflexes needed, I guess. You know, different speeds, <laughs> different uh, different traffic <laughs> up in the sky when it's uh, when it's not a military operation. But um, And then they came with a certain kind of discipline and sense of responsibility that mm-hmm. kind of of uh, grow into, I guess, through a military career. For better or worse, it's still 
pretty much a meritocracy. So skills mm, get you places. There, there's that word, meritocracy. <laughs> skills do tend to take you places and you have, you come to expect a certain structure, you come to expect certain merits and a certain way of doing things. And there's a passion for it there. Mm-hmm. So they, they, they come with a, with a different sort of dedication from what I've seen with civil um, aviators. Not that they're not good at their job, but mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different sort of level of the passion. And uh, you, do you remember when your father made the switch to civil mm-hmm. aviation? Early 2000s, I think. Mm-hmm. Sometime in the early 2000s. Um, he went to a small um, airline uh, that used to be Carpater. Ah, okay. uh, it's still around, but I think they're down to like three or four planes now that they're leasing to other companies. Mm-hmm. And did he ever consider joining Tarom or was it just like not to my knowledge, the offers no. that not to my knowledge, no. I think he had, for whatever reason, uh, certain respect for Carpater and the... Uh, It was it was a choice for him. It's a it's a good thing. It's uh, he didn't enjoy any of the the shady airlines that we're going to talk about. <laughs> no, he probably wouldn't. It would have it would have been a bit awkward. <laughs> Although you know, whoever the the employees on the ground were in those companies, they were not at fault about I mean, what no was airline going is pristine. Let's um, <laughs> you know, yes. obviously. I mean, some <laughs> some might uh, like to imagine that they're the cleanest, but. <laughs> Translation, we cram as many passengers as possible into oh, flights. So, so statistically, we are cleaner per passenger. No, Jesus Christ. Doesn't feel clean when you're in the plane. No, no. it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, let's uh, take a first dive into whatever has been happening in our uh, national airlines throughout the last few decades. I'd like to introduce you to a few interesting people that have left their mark on Tarom. Uh, the selection is limited because uh, what has happened at management level with this company is a endlessly revolving door of new and recurring characters. At one point, I, I, I thought about going over a year-by-year timeline, but it's futile because it, it would just be too confusing and the list of names in rapid-fire succession would be just mind-numbing. Uh, at, at some point, uh, you basically had people staying less than a year or six months in that position mm-hmm. so there's no point it would just be a character names. rich plot that yeah. cannot be condensed into a yeah, movie yeah 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 uh, so i sort of took my pick of some notable names and to be honest i am not at all convinced that these people are the shall we say most interesting of the bunch <laughs> but because of reasons <laughs> yes but they sure do seem to keep uh, popping up both in tarom's timeline as well as in other parts of our glorious nation's road towards late stage capitalism so for me they were kind of interesting i'm sure i'm sure i i don't want to discriminate i'm sure everyone else <laughs> that is involved in the story of our uh, flag carrier is uh, probably very interesting. We see you, we acknowledge you, you're, you're special, <laughs> but we have a limited time. And uh, Totally unrelated is a totally fair podcast. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and for the sake of uh, caution, I also need to state... <laughs> To those that do not already know that I am not an investigative journalist nor a lawyer, so don't sue me. Uh, <laughs> and my ability to determine the degree of guilt of these people in the success or ruin, mostly ruin, of the ventures they were involved with prior, during or after their time with Tarom is limited. But I do think that if your name keeps popping up alongside businesses that seem to be linked to shady transfers to shell companies or bankruptcy, or just general weirdness, you might just be an interesting character. That's that's all I'm saying. Things seem suspicious and <laughs> yes. we're just going to sprinkle a lot of allegedly everywhere. Yes, yes. And now that we got the disclaimers out of the way, let's get to it. Let's set the stage for our first character that is actually a double act that I'll call the Brutaru clan or dynasty or family business venture. That's the one. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the patriarch, Nikolai Brutaru, and then about the daughter following in his footsteps. Both were in charge for only two or three years, uh, the father between 1994 and 1996, and the daughter between 2009 and 2011, which although it might seem like it's not a long time, and it's, it's not, not <laughs> if you really want to implement a plan, a long-term plan, but it's the longest time considering the average lifespan of a manager at the Roma's we said, it's, it's ridiculous, but also plenty of time for them to become... Very interesting characters. 
I am sure this has nothing to do with anything and it's just a piquant little tidbit that I'm casually just throwing out there. Uh, but the family has a connection with former President Traian Basescu. Dun dun. <laughs> Family is very important for Romanians. Yes, I, uh, yes. I, I think God- godfatherliness as well. Yes, extremely. <laughs> so more specifically, Daddy Brutaru was close enough to Bosescu for the latter to be his daughter's godfather. Again, traditional values. <laughs> so... Uh, Allegedly. Yes. <laughs> um, we can say that Tarom's financial problems started in 1991. So, you know. I mean, you know, Romania's financial problems yes. started in 1991. <laughs> they were there from the get go. Um, and, Good uh, people on all sides. <laughs> wonderful people on all sides. In 1991, Tarom decided to keep its fares low against foreign airlines uh, while plunging into expensive debt to buy free Airbus and A five, brilliantly Romanian strategy. Yes. <laughs> and Boeing aircraft 737. I don't know. I'm not a plane geek, unfortunately. So Big plane, mostly white. <laughs> yes. It, Cute snoot. Uh, Hence, the idea of privatizing the airline is put across. But unlike companies operating in other sectors, civil aviation is considered of national interest and prestige, sort of. Keep the precious. Yes. And so its privatization... And so its privatization can't happen without the government's blessing and oversight. Ah, Uh, that word again. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Tarom and other major companies were transferred under the administration of the State Ownership Fund, Fondul Proprietății de Stat, uh, for this exact purpose. Uh, as anything in Romania that has a very pompous name, you know it's not working as intended. <laughs> <laughs> Usefulness is inversely proportional yes. to pompousness. <laughs> yes. In the meantime, uh, while bureaucrats are making elaborate plans to find opportunities to potentially do something sometimes in the future, what uh, does the National Air Carrier's Chief do to address the issues mentioned earlier? One of Nikolai Brutaru's main objectives was replacing the existing fleet. So he tries to sell several planes on the cheap, uh, not not by my estimations, because I don't know what a plane should cost how many, now. How many washing machines would that be? I f- <laughs> I, I've no idea. How many idea. washer dryer? I'm just yeah. quoting just quoting the experts here. <laughs> Brutaru turns for funding to a private airline company by the name of Duck Air. Oh yes, <laughs> it's not Duck as in Duck, <laughs> not as in Mac. Ah, it's just like stupid Romanian history. We came from the ducks who came from the trucks and then, you know, intermingled with I mean, the, the Romans. The alternative would be Dex who came from tracks. Dex from, from Dex. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it does uh, not translate well, but it's, it, it's good that it's a thing of the past. Yeah. So, uh, you know, jokes aside, it's supposed to be a reference to the Dacians who were a population that the was, was comforted by the Romans. Yes, yes, yes. So that uh, company, Dark Air, uh, was owned by by businessman George Ponescu, whose name is linked to the bankruptcy of Banco Rex, uh, one of the big banking scandals of the 90s in Romania. <laughs> We're starting off re- well, right? Great resume. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was the deal between Tarom and Duck Air? Essentially, the Romanian government negotiated the transferral of route rights to Ponescu's private company for all domestic flights, as well as regional flights to Thessaloniki, Istanbul, Sofia or Kiev. So already they were like, take this off our hands. It's it's (laughs) fine. You know, you're our competitor in one way or another, but like, we're gonna just like seed you these things like. Just for funsies, I yeah, guess. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You can no, have no, no, these. Okay. No, no worries if not. <laughs> it, it, for that, right? For that. Uh, which is not going to bite us in the ass. Which, again, a brilliantly Romanian business trend. Yes. From what I could make out of Ponescu's convoluted financial engineering, and by the way, this is what he himself calls what he has been doing. Um, Everybody wants to be an engineer. Yes. I mean, it's very Eastern European, isn't it? Right, right. So his MO was roughly as follows. As he had links inside Bancorex, uh, he got the bank to provide most of the starting capital for Duck Air, which was around $20 million at the time. And when Bancorex went bankrupt, <laughs> the bank had only paid for like $6 million worth of those shares. Shortcuts. Yes. <laughs> and, um, be, you know, when uh, the shit hit the fan, Bancorex was split up into two entities, so to speak. One was Becere, which got all the viable assets 
And then there was this AAAC, Autoritatea pentru Administrarea Activelor Statului. So it would be like the authority for the management of state uh, bonds or shares, something like that. Something of the sort. Yeah. So, and the, they, they got all the toxic bonds. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I've only heard about BGD. <laughs> yeah. So the point is, Duck Air was not primarily conceived to provide a viable private airline alternative, although I understand it was uh, very much in vogue for a few years for those flying uh, for business purposes. But uh, the venture it wa- was rather an instrument for fleecing all the companies that had invested in it through Bancorex. Real estate is the best investment, right? Right, right. Because Duck Air was more interested... Real estate and fleecing, her Romanian. <laughs> yes, because Duck Air was more interested in uh, real estate, which uh, it gained a plenty by suing the claimants for payments and then appropriating the buildings of different factories and companies as a repayment. I mean... <laughs> How um, how interestingly um uh, uh, barter barter right yes 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 how yes. interestingly barterly <laughs> yeah 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 for, I mean you need a lot of real for, estate for a budding capitalist you you need a, re- a lot of real estate to I don't know park your planes or something right right personal helicopters cars whatnot yeah uh, park the- your family. <laughs> <laughs> you have to park your family really well. Right. No double parking, though. One relative per direction. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. During the final year of Brutaru's term is also when he, uh, the dramedy of Tarom's management kicks off, uh, resulting in two decades of madhouse changing of the managing directors every 12 or even six months. Initially, uh, Gheorghe Recaru is declared the winning candidate by Brutaru, but the union contests the pesky union, <laughs> contests the results, and even <laughs> writes to complain about it to then Prime Minister Nicolae Vakaroyu. Planes. Planes interrupting us. How very appropriate. Planes exist. Yes. <laughs> I wonder if it's a tarot. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, too cloudy. <laughs> <laughs> the pesky, pesky union. union. <laughs> Contest. Pesky unions. <laughs> Contest the results and even writes to complain about it to then Prime Minister Nikolai Vakaroyu who is definitely a sympathetic character you want to pour your heart out to. Emphasis on the act of pouring. Hashtag alcoholism is not cool, kids. And hashtag inebriated politics. Yeah, totally unrelated. It's a totally fair podcast. We recognize that uh, alcoholism is a struggle. Yes. In this particular character's case, not the reason why he did what he did. (laughs) Not an excuse. (laughs) And not an excuse. (laughs) In said letter, the union points out that the opposing candidate presented a much more detailed and credible plan for restructuring (laughs) Tarom. That's how naive of them. While at the same time contesting uh, even the committee that handled the candidate's evaluation. Because according to them, the said committee was made up of the very people who had overseen the less than ideal trajectory the company had had been running down since the beginning of the 90s. Coincidence? Mm -hmm. The state ownership fund eventually retracted Urakaru's nomination as general director, but the union didn't get its favorite candidate either. If I can't win, no one can win. (laughs) Uh, As the fund nominated a third man who wasn't involved in the selection process at all. The third man. (laughs) A new mystery by Stephen King. (laughs) The company's former technical director, Dan Vulcan great name, who then refuses to accept the nomination (laughs) because this is that kind of telenovela. (laughs) You're hired for what? (laughs) I refuse. I refuse. I don't know you. Get away from me. (laughs) So Vulcan, who alongside other eight managing board members initially defended Recaro, abruptly shifted sides, uh, promising no layoffs, which Recaro... Oh no, I was thinking of a different (laughs) Recaro. which Recaro was for, (laughs) uh, and uh, to resurrect uh, the Russian fleet by seeking cargo and charter contracts again against what Recaro had proposed, i.e. going all in to buy new aircraft. Just pulling a switcheroo. Let's just leave Recaro for a bit and make a jump in time to witness the adventure of that other half of the Brutaru clan by her name, Ruxandra Brutaru. A lot of bakers in this family. (laughs) Care to explain that for people who... Uh, Nah, never mind. All your listeners know Romanian. (laughs) Well, no, 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 no. 
So brutaro means baker. Yes. There, solved. Joke explained. Ah, Joke explained. Ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> now, even as she was hailed as a much needed fresh face that could breathe new life into the national airlines, the Killjoys pointed out a possible conflict of interest in her case as her father was a stakeholder at a private aviation company, which we're going to talk about a lot more later, called Blue Air. Oh no, not no conflict of interest. We don't talk business. <laughs> we just, you know, talk about... Talk about our, the kids. <laughs> about the kids, about, I don't know, Remy. Does they have the office daughter? Yes, father. Yes, yes. But of course, uh, Ruxandra proved them wrong by behaving like an absolute professional. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, during her tenure, Tarum ceded a very lucrative flight, the one linking Bucharest to Valencia, in favor of that uh, particular private operator we mentioned before. Ah, the great exodus. Mm. She also failed to present Tarom's bid for the handling of the Romanian air posting services yet again in favor of Blue Air. Right, right. I mean, girl is busy. She just forgot. Blue Air is just helping. It just slipped her mind. It's just, it's just helping handle the big exactly. load. Exactly. It's always nice when brothers help each other out. But my girl wasn't just your usual boring, stick in the mud kind of crook. Lady had vision. <laughs> Diva had dreams. And Eastern she was... Europe has grifting talent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Diva had dreams and she was thirsty for some of that sweet media exposure. Allegedly. Yes. <laughs> While there are many things that need to be done at the airline, Ruxandra decides that the best use for taxpayers' money is to commission a show from a private network, mind you, titled I Want to Be a Flight Attendant, hosted by Dan Negru. So Romanian listeners already already know that it's Oof. like knuckle-dragging levels of stupid, a boatload of cringe and sexist jokes. Way before Netflix, kids. Oh my Way God. before Netflix. The fact that that man <laughs> still has a career, it's mind-boggling to me, but also... You gotta work. You gotta yeah. work for a living. <laughs> it's also an indictment of much of our public, I guess. It's proof of yes. the state of things. Yes. <laughs> One would think that if a struggling national symbol like the airlines would pay for a show, at least they would be trying to make a case for the vital services they offer. Maybe their staff's professionalism and their plans for a better, more viable future, you know, to justify somewhat the fact that they've been kept alive on public funds so far. Uh, what? Responsibility? No. No. <laughs> No, no. As uh, the few excerpts you can still find online demonstrate, it, it's more of a Romania's next footballer's wife kind of spectacle. <laughs> Naturally, some journalists were eager to put some numbers to uh, this contract with the private network, uh, only to be shut down by Tarom on the basis of, well, there's a non-disclosure agreement in there somewhere, and well, we are not bound by any Freedom of Information Act, we're not bound to declare an expenditure despite being a publicly funded company, and also, yeah, we don't do that here. Yeah, 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 we thought this would be out of the news cycle by now. And <laughs> by the way, Ruxandra Brutara can't talk to you because she's a very busy person, although she appeared as a regular member of the jury on the show in question. Uh, Multi-professional boss lady, what? Most excellent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> however, these are Sunday League moves. Uh, let's go over the spreadsheets to gauge the real extent of the girl boss's impact. In 2008, just before she assumed her management position, Tarom had losses estimated at around 6.3 million lei. Those numbers hiked way the fuck up the next year to 235 million. Talk that, about escalating quickly. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, then 154 million in 2010 and the final 262 million in her final year with the company. Well, I mean, you know, debt is money you don't have, so why worry <laughs> about it? Converted into euros, that means roughly 140 million euro worth of losses over three years. So, not bad, not bad. You know, massive grifting talent. Her papa would be proud, and I'm sure he, he was. Auditors found a wondrous cocktail of misdeeds under the hood. A vastly different and unjustified wage structures for new hires that were part of Brutaro's entourage, her posse, I guess. <laughs> Operational costs of the Wazu and some 32 million euros that just disappeared. <laughs> We do do that here. <laughs> the union, the pesky union, pushed for an answer on the whereabouts of that sum, but to no way avail. <laughs> In 2011, we have a changing of the guards in terms of the government, so it's time to shuffle some political appointees. 
and uh, our girl Lia Luguza Vasilescu, yeah. <laughs> a senator of the Social Democratic Party, but not like that. Trust me, the name. No, it's it's no, it's just bad. Ask they don't the, make names like they yeah, used to. Ask the Ministry of Transportation to dismiss Ruxandra Brutaru on the grounds of sabotage and intentional mismanagement, which not wrong. <laughs> yes, it's kind of kind of there. Allegedly. It's okay though. Ruxandra quit and took up another position. Ah, a stylish move. You can't fire me, I quit. <laughs> And the disposition, although technically inferior in hierarchical terms, resulted in a salary bump from 6,600 lei to 15,000. Oh, wow. Can I please be demoted yes. for triple the wage? <laughs> <laughs> she eventually took a job for a private tourism operator. More money, much fewer problems. Yes. I mean... <laughs> This is the dream. Then Prime Minister Viktor Pomta decides that all will be well once Tarom's fate is entrusted to a private manager and a foreigner just to be on the safe side because this has been the Romanian way. We don't need to improve, just get a foreigner to come in and sort out our mess. Hope he or she doesn't get caught up in the intrigues and corrupt schemes because we can never trust one another and work together to solve problems for the wider community. Work? Ew. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, we don't do that here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, this was the the uh, a short overview of the Brutaru clan. Uh, yeah, how come there's not more of them? Sounds like a lucrative family. I, I, and and it was a, such a fertile ground for opportunity to park more of the family. In. <laughs> I'm sure there's more, but, you know, smart people diversify. So right, right, right. I'm yeah. guessing. The key to a successful portfolio. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. You don't put all your corrupt uh, issues into one basket. All your rotten eggs in one basket. Yes, exactly. You spread it out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, isn't this basically how the whole landscape of Romanian politics slash business works? Allegedly. Too true. Too yes, true. Yes. Uh, remember Rakaru? The last time we heard from our guy, he was being contested as the new supreme, li- uh, I mean, manager of the airlines. <laughs> Uh, by the way, besides the obvious connection to Brutaru Sr., professionally, he is also the godfather of Ruxandra Brutaru. Oh my lord, this <laughs> woman with... Uh, so, are they the only two godfathers? Can we do a spin-off on that? It's all in the family. <laughs> Keep it in the family. <laughs> the spiritual family, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I guess this explains some of the... I don't know, unwillingness of Ruxandra to compete with the Blue Airs on some of the contracts we mentioned earlier. Now, uh, from what I understand, an important reason for the opposition to Rokaru when, you know, he tried to become uh, the director at uh, Tarom came as a result of his plan to ex 1,000 jobs. He eventually managed to get rid of like 500. Oh, well, Uh, (laughs) better than nothing, I suppose. I mean, obviously, <laughs> this sort of move doesn't make uh, one popular with the union. This pesky character. Again. Yes, yeah, that keeps popping up. Uh, on his side, Rakaro argued that Tarom was uh, employing a staff of 3,500, uh, half of whom were in technical functions, which we know are just not... W- why are they even there? They don't have, like, <laughs> a job to fulfill. And it, he basically said that th- th- there's no point in having that uh, many technical uh, staff because most of its 60 Soviet aircraft were unserviceable. Right, and retraining staff is unheard of. People are just It can't be done. It cannot yeah, be done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, actually, replacing a fleet made up roughly 80% of old Russian-made Antonov's, Ilyushin's, and Tapolev's was another of Rokaru's proposals. Antonov, now, that's a, that's an aircraft made for us. It's uh, optimized for rough landing trips and uh, <laughs> they improvised airplanes in the middle of nowhere. Right. Uh, you know, that's why you see them in all the movies about Cogruns in <laughs> <laughs> Latin America. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that, so... And it Expertise. has a cute Expertise. <laughs> <laughs> this is what this podcast brings you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Expertise vibes. <laughs> yeah. So he tried to buy five US made bull 747s, adding to free bull 737s <laughs> already operating. But the Romanian government refused to guarantee Tarom's loans of up to $150 million. All oh, right. Suddenly it's not ours anymore. <laughs> oh this no no i've disowned this child no i mean you should just go forth and you know seek uh, financing from like i don't know more appropriate sources that will eventually ask for the money back in the most horrendous ways i guess uh besides starting a beef with the union during his tenure at tarom our guy also ended up accused of raking up some 250 billion lei in debt by subcontracting auxiliary services to third parties i thought outsourcing was supposed to be cheaper <laughs> Not when he does it. <laughs> not when Romanians do it. No. That's not how you run a business. 
<laughs> if you don't, on other you either run money. it into the ground. Is yeah. the only running we do around here. That's why you have the Antonovs. <laughs> <laughs> you can run it into the ground. Rough landing strips. <laughs> Attempts to privatize Tarom during Recaro's time were underway, with the state supposedly holding on to at least 49% of shares. That was their first call, and then they went, eh, 33.4% would also do. Thank you very much. Was it, was it 33 because uh, Jesus? I don't know, but it's like 33.4%. It's, it's very... It's suspiciously accurate. Yeah, though. yeah. <laughs> Someone was like... Mm. Somebody was like, no, that doesn't look professional enough. <laughs> You gotta make it look exact. Yes. <laughs> so this all happens around 2000, the year 2000. In the year 2000. Uh, and tell me if this surprises you in any way, but nothing comes of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, a fruitless, indebted en- endeavor. <laughs> to this day, nothing comes of it. <laughs> uh, Who'd have thunk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been juggling with like different percentages that they would hold on to for then the, some private uh, a company to take the rest of it. You think maybe they, maybe they think they were playing lotto and they're just testing numbers? No, I, at this point, it's just Jesus take the wheel because nobody I else mean, will. <laughs> it's the same. It's the same chance of success, really. Yeah. <laughs> so by the end of that year, Ricardo was removed from his position by the Minister of Transport Anka Boagio, but the Alas, the story doesn't stop here, because while our, our hero's romance with Tarom may have ended, he had so much more to give. <laughs> or take. <laughs> Mostly take. <laughs> Ever heard of One Te Carpaz? No, not particularly. Not me neither, <laughs> before I was doing research for this episode, but apparently it was the largest tour operator in Romania before it finally went under in the 2010s. No. Oh. And uh, Rakaru was both head of the board as well as uh, a mani- minority stakeholder. So he had skin in the game. Yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> a minority of skin. <laughs> Just a graft. <laughs> a grist graft. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For some, it all started with a kiss. But in the case of Onete, it began with a shady sale to a company from Cyprus called New Marathon Tours, owned by the Thoma family, which also owned several hotels and a cruise ship back in their neck of the woods. So Ricardo had been making deals with the Thoma family since uh, his time at Tarom, when he was called out for inking bad deals for the airline. The outsourcing. <laughs> <laughs> but back uh, back to Onete, uh, the transaction uh, to, to towards the New Marathon Tours raised several eyebrows because it was way below the market price for the assets held by Onete, which included fleets of buses, maintenance facilities and garages for said fleet, large plots of land near the seaside, uh, mountain resort villas and hotels. Oh, this this is just a portfolio that's barely staying together. I mean, I'm doing them a favor with this price. You can sell this for peanuts, actually. (laughs) It's got good bones. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's all it has. Nice call structure. <laughs> the moment the new owners land the deal, they start taking out mortgages and not paying their bills. <laughs> As you do. As you do. <laughs> then uh, they started selling off assets to pay for the said debts. In 2003, Rakaru bows out of his role at Onete, but retains his shares, and in 2007, the Cypriots make their exit, having dug a deep enough hole for the tour operator to finally declare bankruptcy in 2011. Dug all the way down to the tunnels yeah. in Buchej Mountains. Uh, yeah, until they got to, I don't know, circling they struck back, a hole. Circling back to the ducks. Yeah. <laughs> So that was Onete. Uh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> the never-ending story. <laughs> yes. So my man can multitask because in 2004, there was this man, this businessman. The third man again? <laughs> mm, there's a man. There's always a man. There's always a businessman. <laughs> called Nelu Yordake. Mm. <laughs> Does this ring a bell? No, but I was just thinking, you know, there, there's these names, much like Nelu Yordake, who kind of want to sound respectable, but to us it... Something shifty in that name. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Something yeah. sounds shifty about that. The the, the name sort of sets... Uh, I don't know if it's the Yordake or the Nelu. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dare you. My my father is a Nelu. Well, I mean... Nelu is perfectly <laughs> fine. It's Yordake that's shifty. Okay, fine. <laughs> so there was this... Allegedly. Bus- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so there was this businessman called Nelu Yordake who launches a new private airline called Blue Air remember ah uh, yes uh, another one of my not favorite this airlines. this is a very postmodernist timeline i realize because we've mentioned blue air before and now we're sort of 
here at the beginning of... Uh, uh, listeners of this episode should also try watching uh, Tenet. <laughs> So, in 2004, when Blue Air is founded, Yordaki appoints Gheorghe Recaru as general manager. His first stint will last until 2009, and then he'll swoop in to save the company around 2013 again. But let's pace ourselves. First off, a very brief look at Nello Yordaki, for his gaze is like that of Medusa. You don't want to <laughs> be under it for long. Uh, to start off, he is currently serving time for defrauding European funds, money laundering, and other white collar crimes. I mean, if you're overachiever, going, if you're going to do crimes, the white collar type is the best type of crime you can do. The man earned his nickname as the Asphalt King because of his appropriation of money that was meant to go into building the Aradnodlak Highway. Apparently, these finances were redirected towards his own group of companies, known as Romstrad, to fuel his entrepreneurial vision to build an airport for low-cost carriers in bumfuck nowhere, Adonati Kopacheni. Oh my god. <laughs> Which, again, excellent name. Which, you know, it should, it should keep its local charm and stay at bumfuck nowhere, so obviously <laughs> you're not going to build a highway. <laughs> yes. It's planes in, planes out only. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, you commute by helicopter, I right. guess. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens while Rocario is at Blue Air? During the man's first stint, the company gained control of a sizable portion of the national air travel market, courtesy of, as we said, some help from uh, <laughs> Tarom's uh, <laughs> uh, Brutaro, uh, being the second largest player behind Tarom. Uh, the authorities started investigating Nelu Yordake, the dude with the dough, in 2012, and a year later, Rakaru, once again general manager and a minority stakeholder at Blue Air, calls a meeting of the board with the stated intent of suspending Yordake, because, you know, he was damaging to the company, Obviously. having been put under arrest. Uh, but what Rakaru actually did was to transfer all the assets of Blue Air to a newly formed entity operated by an associate of his, Luciana Paunescu, along with a few pals from his days as a pilot at Tarom. Wait, I need to process. So, <laughs> I'll give you um, a few minutes. We need to protect these assets. Here, a friend of mine can hold them. <laughs> yes, is that what we're doing? Yes, yes Okay, basically. sure. <laughs> and we're still, this is still a publicly owned company. Right? Uh, no, still, no, no, it's Blue Air. Oh, it's Blue Air. Sorry. It's Blue Air. Cut this part you, out. You, you can do whatever. No. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the group paid for a phony valuation slash audit of the whereabouts of Blue Air that basically said that the company was in dire straits, although from what I understand that wasn't the case, and then proceeded to undervalue all the assets that would be included in the takeover transfer. And you might ask yourself, uh, but didn't anyone notice what they were up to? Well, my boy Rakaru had friends in high places, including ANAF, which is uh, the agency that is actually charged with preventing fraud. <laughs> Allegedly. Uh, and uh, he had them uh, sign off on the takeover as being legit, uh, while also cutting him a sweet deal by having him pay back only 10% of Blue Air's total debts. <laughs> I mean, that would make home buying a lot easier. <laughs> so this is... Uh, Can this everyone else get that deal? This is uh, what comes from being excellent at networking and having great social skills. Is oh, what I right. Mean. Introverts can't have nice things. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll live. You remain a peasant. <laughs> <laughs> From what I could it's okay, trees are much better company than most people. <laughs> uh, from what I could find in archived articles, there were speculations about an orchestrated arrest coupled with a hostile takeover to strip Nelly Yordaki of the jewel in his crown. What? Politically coordinated stuff? No way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Th this is not to say that Nelu Yordaki was some innocent, perfectly humble and wonderful businessman, because of course not. <laughs> from what I could piece together from the puzzle of his ventures throughout the last three decades, Rakaru is your uh, typical case of failing upwards. <laughs> oh my. I mean, to be fair, because we want to be fair on this podcast... Rakaru was, before, you know, he started his uh, management career, he was uh, sort of uh, uh, regarded as a good professional. He was uh, known as being the pilot that uh, flew in the Pope on his first visit to Romania. Oh, hashtag blessed. <laughs> Literally. 
But the thing is, despite the fact that his managerial career has been strewn with yikes and dubious dealings, uh, unless you start digging up a bit deeper uh, into his background, his Google results have been really manicured, so to speak. <laughs> like, you'll find info about him flying the Pope in and being head of the country's most successful private airline company. Uh, he was also awarded the prize for the best Romanian CEO in 2018. And he's still uh, given things to run. Just uh, last year, he was given a role in Air Oradea. Oh, Yes, my that's Lord. a thing. <laughs> Coming soon to an airport near you. <laughs> yes, uh, it's supposed to be a regional airline with its base in my hometown. <laughs> uh, of course, he's presented as a bootstrappy manager that built up Blue Air with just a handful of pals. <laughs> And didn't he do a wonderful job? Strategically placed pals. <laughs> yes. All, all the lines go up in the terms of the number of passengers for Blue Air and their fleet of airplanes. So that's all that matters, right? I mean, if you choose your KPIs carefully, you can project exactly the success you want people to see. <laughs> yeah. But to me, what's even more infuriating is that he's spewing that annoying one-size-fits-all arguments of how pay cuts and layoffs and sticking it to the union, remember oh the my, union? The filthy union did. <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know, this is the solution to Tarom's many, many problems. And in fact, in an interview he gave in 2020, when obviously Tarom was extra fucked because of the pandemic, <laughs> Uh, Rakaru gave his two cents on what should be done. And the title of the piece itself is literally a quote of his saying how an efficient manager would need to hold his own against the unions, arguing that actions need to be ruthless and have the full backing of the government. And uh, I think the only new buzzword that he seems to have picked up uh, in comparison to what I have read about his outlook during his uh, actual tenure at Tarom was automation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because he, he incorporated that into his uh, speech, like, you know, you need to reduce positions in the company for automation. Right. Efficiency, right. efficiency, efficiency. Hello, fellow modernists. I know a word too. <laughs> yes. And I mean, I mean, look, like sometimes you might need to eliminate certain jobs, but like... Sure, surely things can be made more efficient. As time goes on, corporations are allegedly are supposed to grow. And yes, you're going to need to shift some stuff around, but it's not, you know, yeah, that no. clean cut, like, oh, get these people out of here, get those machines. I mean, it, you can't really, it, you it, can, again, retrain people it's who also, are perfectly it, capable of learning something that's not that dissimilar from what they've been doing. It's also the case that it's always efficiency according to the bosses. Like, it's right, never, right. They're, yeah. they're cutting the people that are actually doing the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they wonder why things don't get done. It's, it's amazing. And, you know, also, considering how shambolic the management team at the National Carrier has been for the past decades, I'd say maybe start there with the <laughs> redundancies, right? Always start trimming from the tips. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of sick and tired of people parroting the whole, well, managers are not supposed to be doing charity. If they need to lay off people, then that's just like what they need to do. And then yeah, it's... After oversight and careful assessment and understanding what goes on there. Yeah, but, you know, this thing that, uh, you know, it's not... People skip a lot of steps in between. What they're basically saying is that uh, we don't care about this stuff and shouldn't care about this stuff because it doesn't impact us. And, you know, maybe it's true if you just lay off a few people, but when you lay off like hundreds and thousands of people, then it kind of becomes a sort of community issue, especially if Definitely. most of the employees are located in like one or two uh, cities, right? Uh, so this is just incorrect. And uh, with, we've discussed this previously, although we were sold this fatalistic narrative of, well, what you're going to do, this is just how things are, that this is just a common disease of economies all over the former communist bloc. Turns out it's not quite like that. Only if you don't actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and by it's not quite like that, I don't just mean that, you know, everyone else... Uh, outside Romania does it better <laughs> because it's it's not just a positive story like it can be worse it can be better oh no but it's been so inspiring so far <laughs> <laughs> yes I mean just just as a sort of brief aside 
what has happened to, for instance, both the Hungarian and the Polish national airlines is is indif- indicative of this. Like things, you know, things don't have just a fatalistic one way of happening. It can be worse or it can be better. <laughs> It all depends on what quality of work you put in. <laughs> yes, yes. So, uh, for instance, as I understand, uh, the Polish Airlines lot uh, was partially privatized in 1999, which shares sold to a Swiss investor. And instead of piling on debt to renew its fleet, <laughs> uh, lot did not really have any kind of shame in just leasing out uh, airplanes for... Oh, look, correct outsourcing. <laughs> yeah, from like, uh, even private carriers like Blue Air. And it seems like Lot also had uh, an important advantage in, uh, in the sense that domestic flights are not especially attractive to low cost carriers. So to like private competition, because unlike Romania, <laughs> Poland has... Oh, you're going to hit me in the trains? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh. Uh, it seems that unlike Romania, Poland has not completely made... Uh, a clusterfuck? A clusterfuck <laughs> of its railway. You know, it probably has kept up uh, its existing railways. I don't know how far along uh, the the route to modernizing it they are, but at least, you know, what they had, they kept. (laughs) Which you might think is not a high task, but it is. We don't do that here. Yeah, we don't do that here. (laughs) It's, yeah. And uh, it's kind of sad because apparently the starting off point for Tarom was much better than uh, in the case of Lot. We had more international uh, routes. I mean, you've described uh, an amazing airline that I haven't met in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> you are born too late, I guess. Oh, right. Oh, dread. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, at this moment, it seems that Lot is the one that is slowly but surely expanding uh, onto the European market, at least. Well, good for them. Yeah. But let, let's have a look at our other neighbors. <laughs> and for <laughs> once, Romania is not doing, you know, the worst of jobs. <laughs> Which is not to be taken as an inspiration and no, an encouragement. No, please don't. <laughs> uh, let's uh, have a look at the Molev shit show, the Hungarian Airlines. Apparently, it all started in 1992. Which, it was nice to have a regular direct link between Cluj and Budapest while Malev was still around. It was nice while it lasted. Yeah. (laughs) This is where good things come to die. So, in 1992, the Italian national airline Alitalia and an Italian bank purchased 35% of Malev. But by 1997, the Hungarian banks had to repurchase the Italian shares. After many years of trying, the National Property Fund managed to sell the airline to Airbridge, a Russian company, in 2007. Business with the Russians didn't work out. Oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) So unusual. (laughs) And in February 2010, the majority owner of the airline once again became the Hungarian state and the majority owner by like 95%. Since Malev was in financial straits, the Boinoi government injected 25.36 billion forints into the company only a few months before the national elections. <laughs> Convenient coincidence. <laughs> Always a good idea. By this time, Hungary was an EU member, and so Wizair, <laughs> all you people <laughs> coming up. <laughs> the <off>. other union. <laughs> yes, <laughs> all you people who just uh, went on your summer vacation, <laughs> raise your hands in the air. <laughs> Uh, so Wizzair, a private company and a competitor, initiated proceedings against the Hungarian government's financial aid package for Molev, which they contended was illegal state aid. You know, incidentally, Varady Yozef, the CEO of Wizzair, had also served as CEO at Molev between 1999 and 2003. Loyalty jumps with the captain. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I don't know, this uh, thing whereby people in high position in state-run enterprises suddenly become the founders or CEOs of private competitors is not exclusive to our uh, neighbors, I guess. After the elections, Viktor Orban (laughs) tried to convince Chinese investors to take Molev off his hands, but the investors did not bite. (laughs) Ooh. Burn. Going from the Russians to the Chinese. A tough position to be in. Mm. 
In January 2012 came the very bad news that the European Commission had determined that the state aid to Molave was indeed illegal and that Molave must pay back all the money it received from the Hungarian government ever since 2003. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> After uh, having two planes seized at foreign airports by the creditors, Molave immediately ceased all flight activity on the 3rd of February 2012. The airline's total debt were 60 billion foreigns, that's like 270 million US dollars, at the time of its shutdown. On 14th of February 2012, the Metropolitan Court of Budapest declared Molave bankrupt. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even notice the date. Happy Valentine's Day, you broke motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess that uh, left the door open for Wizard to basically be like, yeah, we're the only boys in town here. I mean, they, they did well for themselves with all the space. Yeah, they definitely, made. definitely. And, you know, uh, some of the more, I don't know, I guess, libertarian, libertarian uh, inclination would argue that well as long as you know the customer is well served by the private company that's perfectly fine that's yes, where I would make the differ yeah <laughs> and also like it's a private but then again it really depends on what the customer expectations are yeah uh, and also like it's a private company you know if eventually it goes bankrupt then like what you don't have air transportation anymore like what what do you do what what what's, what happens in the interim before oh, you, competition you, kicks in you can I possibly don't... be talking about planning ahead and having <laughs> constructive <laughs> strategies for the future we, we don't do that here <laughs> no come on we just fly by the seats of our fans yeah <laughs> such as they are <laughs> yes 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 yeah i guess uh, this was uh, this was it for uh, our overview of interesting characters and interesting factoids about uh, the state of the industry of the aviation industry is in romania if this was a george r, r. martin uh, true crime novel lots of the lots of characters would have been killed off by now <laughs> How do you know they haven't been? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Any thoughts? Concluding thoughts? Well, I'll just grab a snack. I wish we had better trains. I really do. <laughs> mm. So our our, con- uh, our conclusion for this episode is like, fuck planes, we need better trains. No, we, I mean, we need both, definitely. But, you know, I, this is a very small country. We don't necessarily need domestic air travel to be the most convenient option. Hey, we need don't, don't this the size. It's what you do with it. <laughs> right. I'm told. I don't know. Right, we're not doing anything with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. It's small enough to handle, but we're not doing anything just, with it. It's just sitting there limply. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the lesbian making all the dick jokes. Uh, interesting Saturday indeed. <laughs> I provide. You never disappoint. Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, so do you want uh, to help me to say bye-bye to the listeners? Bye-bye to the listeners? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. First you have to awkwardly go like, oh, it was nice being here. Thank you, Jesus. Something, something. And but I told you it was an interesting Saturday indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and if you're enjoying this episode on YouTube, uh, you might have noticed some of the pretty pictures, courtesy of our friend Lehel, who is an avid plane spotter and has an eye for all the lovely snoots out there. Thank you very much. And guys, go and check out his work on Instagram or Facebook at Cluj Spotting, one word. Uh, links in the description. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening. If you have the time and the disposition, share, like, and subscribe. Oh, come on, people. It doesn't take that long. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Surely you can do that. <laughs> uh, and I promise there's better episodes after this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, see you next uh, time. Bye. Bye. Bye.